Why doesn't God stop our persecutors? Hi, welcome to today's little lesson. Thank you very much for joining me once again. If you're a regular viewer, you know that working our way verse by verse through the entire book of Acts and not just for academic reasons so that we can fill our heads with more historical knowledge, but more so for uh, practical reasons, we want to experience exactly what the early Christians experienced. And I recognize, of course, that some of what was experienced by the early Christians seems to be somewhat unique due to certain factors like uh, the time and place in which they were living there in Jerusalem and the sovereign will of God in bestowing gifts of the Holy Spirit upon his church. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, the same Holy Spirit, uh, same salvation, same forgiveness of sins, same truth that is so transforming and and same holy spirit you know that is worked in their lives is working in our lives and same god who can sovereignly bestow gifts of the spirit today he has off and on all through church history and maybe you and i will be alive during the next great outpouring. We certainly would love to be a part of that. Regardless, it doesn't mean that we can't experience any miracles. There are some miracles that we read about in the book of Acts that uh, have happened in my life and have happened in millions of other Christians' lives. And we'll talk about those things when we come to them. All right, so anyways, we left off in our previous little lesson in Acts, right at the end of Acts chapter 7. Uh, the martyrdom of Stephen. He wasn't um, an apostle, wasn't named as an apostle, but was appointed to serve widows because he was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom and had a great reputation. But God decided to use him in miraculous ways. And, 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 and of course, and, and it was uh, the purpose of it was not just for God to put on a magic show, but to draw attention to the gospel, because that's the most important thing of all. Anyways, it cost Stephen his life. He was uh, one of, <clears throat> you know, multitudes of people who have given their lives for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of Christ. But there are no regrets with Stephen, I can assure you now. He is living in that realm, in that place, which God allowed him a preview in his final moments when he had the gift of discerning of spirits, <clears throat> excuse me, bestowed upon him. And he could see into heaven and could see Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. And uh, that was, uh, a, what a way to go. Okay, in fact, we read in the last verse of Acts uh, chapter 7, having said this, he fell asleep. And so it seems like there was even some mercy in his, um, in his death from the Lord, uh, that it wasn't a slow, agonist thing where he lied under a pile of rocks for you know, hours, and then finally uh, expired. Anyways, this is then the beginning of a great persecution, a great outbreak of persecution against the church there in Jerusalem. And although there had been some persecution, specifically targeting the leaders, uh, this is on a whole different scale. And I think that we have perhaps overlooked the incredibly important role, significant role, that uh, this young man named Saul played in that outbreak of persecution. Because we have to wonder, what was the difference, you know, before and after the stoning of Stephen? Um, why, why wasn't there this outbreak, this large-scale persecution prior to Stephen and it's seen Stephen's martyrdom, and it seems like Saul of Tarsus, later known as the Apostle Paul, uh, played a very, very significant part and could have been the primary catalyst behind this behind this whole thing. 
Um, just briefly, I want to go back into Acts chapter 7 because we're introduced to this young man named Saul in verse number feet, uh, verse number 58. Uh, when they had driven Stephen out of the city, they began stoning him, and, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, um, according to uh, the Mosaic law, when there was a stoning for, for, for someone who was guilty of capital punishment, it had to be, you know, the, the witnesses, the ones who testified in, in the court proceeding who had actually seen the crime committed, they would be the ones who would have to throw the first stone. And, uh, and, and it was, to, to, you know, to deter people from lying under oath in, in court because, you know, to tell a lie about somebody and say, I saw this person do thus and so, uh, and, and they deserve to die. And then to be, you know, be the one who picks up the very first stone to throw, you, you'd have to really sear your conscience, wouldn't you? And so the witnesses, all who were there in the court proceedings when, when uh, Stephen was on trial before the Sanhedrin, um, they're the ones who are actively going to stone him. But they need full mobility, you know, and they have these big robes on, apparently, uh, that would hinder them from being able to pick up rocks. Maybe they didn't want to get their robes dirty from the rocks and stones they'd be picking up to stone Stephen with. So they lay their robes at the feet of a young na man named Saul. It doesn't say a passerby named Saul. Uh, I, I think the evidence is pretty substantial here that Saul was, if, if, if not a witness to the proceedings and the trial of Stephen, um, perhaps even to a greater degree he was involved and actually a member of the Sanhedrin. Now, there is no proof positive that Saul was ever a member of the Sanhedrin, but there's good reason to think that that was true at least at some point in time, okay, and and uh, you know, do you get off and on the Sanhedrin uh, or on and off the Sanhedrin? I I, I don't know. I'm 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 of the inclination that Saul was, if not a member of the Sanhedrin, he was certainly high up in the echelons of um, Jewish authorities there in Jerusalem. And then, of course, it would you know, affect all of Israel. So we don't want to read this and just think, just think of a teenager who happened to be passing by and you know, with his mouth agape watching this stoning. Um, you know, and, and they grab him and say, hey, would you watch our coats so that nobody will uh, walk off with them as we're stoning this fellow? Uh, no, uh, much more involved in that. We're, we're going to see momentarily that the, Luke wrote that Saul was in hearty agreement uh, with putting Stephen to death. So he had to have some, you know, some uh, reason to be in hearty agreement. This person deserves this. So he had to know something about what this person has said or done, or at least the rumors about him. Okay, so, um, uh, and anyways, that's the beginning of Saul. So, uh, this is not the only person uh, whom Saul was involved in their execution. I'm going to jump to the end of Acts just momentarily where in, in, to read a short section of Paul's defense before King Agrippa. Remember that. And he's recounting his former life. And in Acts 26, verse number 9, he says, So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many, many of the saints which literally means the holy ones, in prisons, prisons plural, having received authority from the chief priests. So, you know, there, um, you know, he has the highest authority, the Jewish authority behind him in these actions of locking up Christians. But look what he goes on to say. But also when they, when they plural, were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. See, that's reason to think that he was a well, he was a voter, a voting member of something to decide who gets put to death. Uh, 
And and so how, how what what do you have to have to have a voting privilege? It kind of seems like he was a member of the Sanhedrin. People be on trial, and he'd hold up his hand and say, "Yes, they deserve death," and so take them out and stone them. And and as I punish them often in all the synagogues, you know, so he's searching through all the synagogues to find the believers in Jesus. I tried to force them to blaspheme. That is, you know, to deny Jesus, and then they could escape their punishment. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. Well, we know the story about his trip to Damascus. He says foreign cities here. So perhaps Luke, you know, condensed the story to one foreign city that Paul, or Saul rather, traveled to. So how many people, you know, were, were executed, that Paul, the Christians that Paul saw, rather, had something to do with. Doesn't look good, does it? Okay, so um, let's start reading now in Acts chapter 1, uh, and just read verse number 1. Saul was in hearty agreement, this is a commentary on Stephen, with putting him to death. In the Greek, uh, there's one word that's translated now in the New American Standard as hearty agreement. I'm not going to give you that word because it doesn't make a difference, but it's only one word, and then it's translated into two words, hearty agreement. It can be translated, took pleasure. So you can read this way, Saul took pleasure in being there to see Stephen Stone. And you just think about the brutality, you know, being executed by stoning. You know. And to take pleasure in, in that. It shows you the heart of this man who became the preeminent persecutor of the church in Jerusalem and, and, and beyond Jerusalem, as he himself testified. Uh, and, and he may have been the primary human catalyst behind the outbreak of persecution there in Jerusalem after the death of Stephen. So we continue reading in Acts chapter 8, in verse number 1. And on that day, a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Well, we asked the question at the beginning of this little lesson, why doesn't God stop our persecutors? I mean, we talked about that in the last little lesson. Uh, poor, you know, the, the, the poor Stephen, but the greater thing we regret is Stephen had such a marvelous ministry that was so short-lived and cut short so quickly. What could have happened if, if you know, he could have lived and God could have continued to use him in such marvelous ways? Well, the answer to that, of course, to remind ourselves, is, is that it wasn't so much Stephen, it was the Holy Spirit. It was the Lord, and the Lord can anoint anybody, and we're going to see momentarily here that he then uh, anointed Philip, another one of those seven so-called deacons that were appointed to wait on tables to serve the widows in Jerusalem, okay? So, um, you know, one, one aspect to always keep in mind is, is that when we, we see someone who got a marvelous, a marvelous ministry that God allows to be cut short, um, God's not limited. He can use anybody, okay? And nobody is irreplaceable. But another thought to ponder is a possibility. Remember that when Jesus, uh, we read this in Acts, Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, he told um, his, his apostles, but, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And, and so lots of folks have noticed that, you know, this is where all the early Christians were scattered to. They were in Jerusalem. They were scattered to Judea, which is the larger region of which Jerusalem is in Judea, and then Samaria, which is north of 
of um, Judea. Of course, north of Samaria would be Galilee. And you will remember, I'm sure, that, you know, the Samaritans were no friends of the Jews. And so now, by, result, by the result of this persecution, Christians, without any real choice in the matter, have had to flee for their lives from Jerusalem uh, under the threat of death by stoning. And, and many of them find themselves north in Judea and then further north into Samaria where there's people waiting whom God loves. And remember the woman at the well of Samaria, the first person to whom Jesus revealed himself as being the Messiah. Okay, God hadn't stopped loving them. So that's a possibility as we ask the question, why does God sometimes not stop our persecutors? Because there's a higher plan for the gospel to go out. Do you ever think about that? Paul, uh, writing from jail, a prison, in Philippi, he said, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So he, he was looking for the silver lining and all that. And, and, and basically what he said is because I'm in prison, everybody, all the Praetorian Guard have heard about Jesus because I've had a chance to testify. And a lot of the brethren who are, are not in prison, they've been emboldened to, to preach the gospel because of my imprisonment. And so the gospel is going further. Uh, as a result of my imprisonment, okay? And so in the case of this persecution, the gospel went further into obviously where God had intended for some time for it to go. So if God allows your persecution, uh, look for the silver lining. Uh, and, and, there, and, and there could be other silver linings. I'll, I'll talk about one big one here uh, if we have time in this little lesson, but if not in this one, the next one, all right? Now, here's a mystery to me in verse number one, the, the very last three uh, words in verse number one. It's, it, it said, we, reading before that, they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Again, they were running for their lives, except the apostles. And that's always been a, a head scratcher for me because you think if anyone would have had to flee, uh, and been, been in danger, I mean, you know, they, they would have targeted the leaders. And so I wish I had the answer for that. Um, if I did, of course, I would share it with you. Eventually, the apostles all did uh, fulfill their divine destinies, and they went to different places. I know, for example, that the apostle Thomas, remember Doubting Thomas, uh, church history tells us that he ultimately traveled to India. And you can still go see, uh, you can go see a church building there, I guess, um, that uh, the original congregation, you know, had been established by the Apostle Thomas. So they all eventually went, but for some reason, which I can't explain during this persecution, which caused everyone else to run for their lives, the Apostles remained behind. Maybe it was just temporary, or, or maybe Luke is implying they didn't go to Judea and Samaria, they went further. I, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a bit of a mystery to me. Um, it's interesting, I, I think, or worth noting anyways, that Luke kind of reports this in a matter-of-fact uh, manner, you know, because it's, you know, it's a very truncated report. Um, goodness, Luke is leaving out so many details that we would love to know if we could just know them, but he included what the Holy Spirit inspired him to include. Um, but I just want you to stop and pause and think about the price that was being paid by all the early Christians at this point in time. You know, imagine if you had to run for your life from your home, from your livelihood, from your job, um, you know, you know, gather just a few barest essential belongings because, uh, you, you know, you can't cart stuff with you and, and, and the, the, the trauma that that would be. You know, so obviously God would, would was concerned about their heartache and their suffering that was the result of their faith in Jesus. It was precious to him, and he wasn't indifferent to it. Um, he loves his people. He doesn't want to see his children suffer any more than you want to see your children suffer, but there must have been a higher purpose for it, and we've already considered one of those higher purposes for the greater good of the gospel, to get them out there, because we'll see that um, you know they shared the gospel. 
in those places to 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 where they were scattered, and so it was an expansion of, of the church. But I would submit to you that there was another higher purpose, which we find a scriptural higher purpose, and that is to test hearts. Okay, and I'm going to go into that uh, in, with a deeper dive here momentarily. Um, but let's keep reading just br briefly here um, in, in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 2. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul, now here comes the chief uh, antagonist, Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Well, we already knew about that from his own testimony that we read in Acts chapter 26. But Saul couldn't have just done this single-handedly. Remember, he said in Acts 26 that he received authority from the chief priests. And so th this is a, uh, you know religious governmental persecution uh, from the religious leaders, but, and, but, but, but the, the one doing the actual arresting, the, 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 at least apparently the main person, there may have been others, was Saul. And what's he doing? He's, he's, he's ravaging the church, but he's not going from church building to church building because there were no church buildings to go to. You know, he wasn't gathering up church directories to see who the Christians were. He was going from house to house. And he was trying to get them to blaspheme. He would say, you know, are, are you a Christian? You know, or, you know, but if, you know, if you, and if they said, yes, well, if you deny it, you know, right now and, and repent, we'll let you off the hook. And so can you see that this would have been somewhat of a temptation for Christians to say, well, I'll just pretend like I'm not a Christian. I'll, I'll deny that I know him deny that I believe in him. Of course, they probably knew. Imagine the apostles taught them that Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. But if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. And so, you know, they didn't deny him. And so they knew the consequences. I'm heading to prison. Uh, so, again, Paul needed nothing else than their own testimony to find them guilty of that crime for which he was authorized to arrest them and imprison them. Nobody had to go, you know, before a jury or for a judge and they didn't have to gather the evidence. Okay. Um, he was trying to, as he said in Acts 26, trying to force them to blaspheme, being furiously enraged at him. So um, persecution comes in waves. It's possible that persecution ultimately died down in Jerusalem and everyone was able to return to their homes and their livelihoods and so forth. I don't really know the answer to that, but this was traumatic and it was a big event and to devote one verse to it almost seems unfair. Um, but nevertheless, it has happened throughout church history many, many times. In fact, you know, guaranteed, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to be persecuted uh, to some degree, to some measure. If you're not, you need to be concerned that there's not enough evidence, you know, for people to want to persecute you as a Christian. Okay? And again, not that you're, you're going to get thrown in prison, but you're going to be, you know, made fun of, you're going to lose friends. That's a part of the package. If you want the book of Acts, you have to, you know, accept the persecution. Uh, Peter wrote to the entire church in his day, decades after this, and when there was another wave of persecution, and church history shows that there were waves of governmental persecution against Christians as the church spread around the Mediterranean world within the Roman Empire, you know, there was imperial persecution against the Christian. It came in waves from different emperors and so on. So during one of those times, Peter writes, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. Now, here's the part I don't want you to miss. Which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, see, Christ was persecuted, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 
Well, um, so, so Peter gave us some insight as to the reason that God allowed that wave of persecution. It comes upon you for your testing. God wants to know whose faith is authentic and whose faith is phony. And when the church has an explosion that is of interest, where, you know, the tide turns to where it's not the minority, now suddenly it's the majority, you have lots of people rushing in just to follow the crowd and who are not really believers in Jesus, then there's really very little price to pay now because, you know, I'm joining the majority. I don't want to be in the minority of you that don't believe. So I'll say that I believe and go along with the crowd. And so God tests hearts. The Bible says that in, in numerous passages. And he tests them by putting them through certain circumstances. And so this fiery ordeal that the church during Peter's, uh, the time when Peter wrote his first epistle, was going through a persecution where they were being tested. God wants to see who's going to deny me, who's going to confess me before men. And that's why Peter said, hang on to your faith. It's more precious than gold. More precious than gold. Don't abandon your faith, even if it costs you your life, because great is your reward in heaven. Amen. All right, now let's finish out and just read verse number four of Acts 8. Therefore, those who had been scattered, that is to Judea, you know, outside of Jerusalem, Jerusalem's in Judea, and then north to uh, Samaria, went about preaching the word. Now, I personally never really liked that word preaching the word because I have observed, and I don't think it's, I don't think it's a, misobservation. I think it's observable all through church history that there are some who are called and anointed to preach. You know, we think of standing in front of crowds and preaching. Um, and, and, that, and that takes a gift and an anointing, you know, just the boldness and the ability to do it. Don't feel bad if you don't have that gift. Now, we're all supposed to be ready to make a defense for the hope that is within us. And we can all give our testimony. I suppose we can all you know, stand up in front of a, a, a group, a small group, and, and maybe not be so intimidated by that and, and give our story and tell God's story. You know, uh, that, that, that's okay, but not necessarily with the kind of, you know, anointing that you'd see someone who was called to preach like an evangelist or an apostle. Um, and, and so looking into that word in, in the Greek, it's the word euangelizo. Euangelizo, obviously it, from that word is derived the modern English word of evangelize. And it can also be translated just to announce, you know, uh, I guess in a, even a, in a softer way to, you know, communicate, to share. Uh, proclaim would be a stronger way uh, of saying it. But again, every Christian should, and in this case, every Christian did. Okay, not every Christian is a preacher, but every Christian is uh, a light. Let your light shine. Tell them your story. Tell them the difference that Jesus made in your life. Tell them how you were before and how you are after, and ask them if they've had an experience like that. And if they haven't, then you can tell them God's story, which is, of course, the story of uh, Jesus dying for our sins on the cross and being raised from the dead uh, so that we can become one with him and, 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 and die in Christ and live in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's actually the gospel, okay? Uh, so, so every Christian can do that, and God used all the early Christians to do that in Judea and Samaria. And where were the apostles? I don't know. They're still back in Jerusalem. Again, still scratching my head <laughs> over that, okay? And uh, we're soon going to read about out in our next little lesson about Philip, one of those deacons whom God begins to use like Stephen in Samaria, okay, uh, where, you know, there's all that antagonism between Jews and Samaritans. Okay, so we'll talk about that next time. All right. Hey, we've got a couple of websites we'd love for you to go visit that we think would be a blessing to you. One is davidservant.org and one is heavensfamily.org. At the davidservant.org website, you get a lot of good uh, biblical teaching. We've compiled there over the years on many, many different topics, and uh, you can, it's easy to navigate. I'd love for you to avail yourself of that. And then, of course, Heaven's Family, ministry we pioneered about 21 years ago. And I'm the, no longer the president, but I'm still the founder. And uh, doing work in many parts around the world, doing good work that uh, 
you could get involved in as well. Okay, Heavens Family, that's the word heaven, the letter S, the word family.org. Until next time, may the Lord keep blessing you. Mm-hmm.